Ooh, this one's gonna be very controversial. Hey creeps, my name is Cameron and welcome to Library Macabre where I talk about books, movies, writing, and all things spooky. Today I am doing my February wrap up where I talk about all of the horror books that I read in the month of February. As I said in last month's wrap up, so my goal in 2021 is to read at least 10 books a month, which is actually very ambitious for me because I am a slow reader. I know, it's weird. I've been booktubing for 10 years. I've been reading my entire life. I am surrounded by books all the time. I've watched the YouTube videos on how to speed read. I have tried to apply the techniques. It just doesn't work for me. I don't know why. However, by reading more often, I feel like I can he hit the 10 bookmark and so far so good. Last month I read 21 books. Didn't read quite as many this month, but I did read a total of 11 books. But before we get into my wrap up, I just wanna say thank you so much for all of the great feedback you guys gave me on my video that I posted a couple days ago, which was my very first reading vlog. The comments have been just so supportive and I just wanted to let you creeps know that I, I definitely wanna do more reading vlogs in that style. And please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoy it and without further ado, Let's get into the wrap-up. Whenever Kasha from Kasha's Book Cemetery does a wrap-up video, she always starts with the book that she liked the least and work her way up to the one that she liked the most. I like that a lot, and I think I'm gonna do that for this video. So we're gonna start with my one-star reads, of which there is only one. Ooh, this one's gonna be very controversial. So my one star read for the month of February is Growing Things and Other Stories by Paul Tremblay. There are a lot of people out there who love and admire Paul Tremblay, and I do to an extent. I think he's a great guy. He is clearly a talented writer, and he comes up with some amazing ideas. However, one thing that I talked about in my reading vlog is that I do not like ambiguity in books most of the time. That vagueness just really gets on my nerves because a lot of the time the vagueness is just hiding the fact that there is really nothing there. There's no meat on the bones. Nine times out of ten, ambiguity is there because the author thought of this awesome concept, but they didn't really know how to go on with it. They didn't know how to wrap it up. So they're like, I am going to be ambiguous with it and I can leave it up to the reader to decide and then I don't have to actually tell the story myself. Now that's not always the case. Actually, Paul Tremblay's first book, A Head Full of Ghosts, I thought was done brilliantly. That was a really interesting take on the possession genre. You really had to think for yourself as the reader if the girl was possessed or not, but it's done through this lens of reality TV where you're not really sure what's real and what's not and it just really, really worked. And it's clear that the answers are in the book. You just have to read into it. I think that's when ambiguity really works is when there is so much to unpack and yet the author is like, no, I'm gonna let the reader decide what's going on here, even though they know because they wrote the story. And I think that was a really strong point of Paul Tremblay's debut. Then I read Disappearance at Devil's Rock, which was his second book. And I liked it. I thought it was a bit slow and it didn't really answer my questions, but it was an okay book overall. And then I read Cabin at the End of the World, which was his third book. And the whole time I was reading that, I was like, this better have answers, man. And it didn't. And at that point, I was like, mm, maybe Paul Trimbley's books really aren't for me. But then Growing Things was announced. And this is a short story collection, which I love short story collections as it is. And this also ties in with A Head Full of Ghosts. So that made me a little more interested to read it. There is an audience for this book, and you can see that when you look at the reviews on Goodreads. That is because there are people out there who love that ambiguity. They love those little slices of weirdness that really have no rhyme or reason. As an author myself, I just like storytelling, you know? And I think Paul Tremblay did that with these stories up to a certain point, and then the story just ends. With growing things, that happened again again and again and again and again over and over and over again it got to the point where i would be reading one of the stories and i'd be thinking this is great but i already know it's not going to have an ending and sure enough boom 
no ending. Again, there is an audience for this, so I would never deter anybody from picking up this or any of Trimbley's work because there are clearly people who love his work. My opinions as a book reviewer are not the be all end all of opinions. Nobody's is. My opinions are strictly based off of my own personal taste of which everybody has different tastes. So take my review with a grain of salt. You might really end up liking this. This just isn't for me. So there we go. That's my review of uh, Growing Things. Don't hate me. Now we're going to get into my three-star reads, of which there are two. The first three-star read is Who's There? A Collection of Stories by Dimas Rio. This is a very slim collection of Indonesian horror stories. So if you like movies like The Ring and The Grudge, all of those movies that came out when I was in middle school, you would probably like this book. This is a book that is all about the three G's, as I call it. Grief, guilt, and ghosts. It's kind of like Tales from the Crypt where people do terrible things and then get their comeuppance, but you know, through a much more serious lens and then also ghost girls. I enjoyed this overall, though I will definitely say this is a lot more in the literary department. So this is, I would say, slow burn horror. Now saying that it's slow burn doesn't mean it's boring. In fact, that's one thing that really rubs me the wrong way. I remember going to an independent movie screening once and before the movie, the director was like, yeah, this movie's a slow burn. It's just such a slow burn, man. And then I watched the movie and I'm like, this is just slow. When I think of slow burn, I think of movies like Hereditary where something is off, something's wrong. It's taking its time to get to the resolution and it's slowly creeping on you as the movie goes. It's just this slow, brooding, calculated terror. This is, I would say, a slow burn. The story's definitely creepy up on you. They take their time. They let you get to know the characters a lot like the original ring. This definitely has that essence. Now I will say a couple of the stories are a bit longer and I feel like they could drag a bit in the middle and risk getting boring. After a little bit, I was kind of like, all right, I kind of want to pick up the pace here and move on to the next story. So for that reason, I did end up giving this three stars. I think I actually gave it three and a half, but overall I thought this was a really well-written collection of stories. And if you are looking for diverse horror, this is really good one to go for. My second three-star read is Slumber Party by Christopher Pike. Now, because of the new Netflix show that's coming out based off of The Midnight Club by Christopher Pike, directed by Mike Flanagan, who is like my new filmmaking idol, I have been very excited to go back and revisit some of the Christopher Pike books that I had read when I was a kid and to read some of the ones that I missed. So a couple months ago, I read The Midnight Club and Whisper of Death, both of which I had never read as a kid. And then I was like, you know what? I really want to go back to the beginning, to his very, very first horror novel for teens, read that and kind of work my way through, do like a read through of all of Christopher Pike's books from beginning to end. So that means I am starting off with Slumber Party, which was published by Point in 1985. Christopher Pike's storytelling is weird. It's just weird. He doesn't really work well under the Point umbrella. The Point horror series, while they are very fun and entertaining, are extremely formulaic, and I don't think Christopher Pike works well under a formula. He needs to just do his thing and let his writing breathe, and I think he does that in his later books. This one, on the other hand, is just very simple by the numbers. Slumber Party is about this group of teenage girls who are going on this little ski vacation together, but this trip is a little bit uncomfortable because it's a reunion of sorts. They are meeting up with somebody that they knew when they were really, really young. It's clear that there was some kind of accident involved these girls which left this other girl that they're meeting up with scarred and I don't want to go into it because I don't want to spoil it you find out later on in the book what happened and then of course the girls get snowed in and a lot of weird things start happening at the end of the day this is a fun pulpy read it has all of my favorite point horror tropes you have all of the bitchy characters they're all just kind of unlikable even our lead our protagonist is still not a very good person and I see a lot of people complaining about that on Goodreads but I kind of like it. I don't know. I, I like unlikable characters. I think they're more fun to read than somebody who's perfect in every way. It was cheesy and entertaining. Not my favorite Christopher Pike book at all, but within the point horror structure, I think he did a decent job. So those were my three star reads. Now we're gonna get into my four star reads of which there are four. I always end up having a lot of four star reads for whatever reason. I think it's because it's a nice 
sweet spot. Like these books are good, I really enjoy them, but they're not my favorite books ever written. But my first four star book is Twisted Books to Leave You Shook, book number one, Fright Filter by C.S. James. Now this is kind of like a goosebumps throwback. It's about a 12 year old girl named Nicole who loves playing on her phone. She especially likes using those face filters on Snapchat. And she is best friends with this girl who I would say is kind of a bully. She's not very nice. She encourages Nicole to post something very mean about another girl in their class. But before she's able to post it in the middle of class, her teacher sees her on her phone and takes her phone away. And when she gets it back, she notices some really strange monster face filters on her phone. So she ends up playing with them for a little bit. And then of course she ends up turning into these monsters and she has to go on a journey to figure out how to change herself back. So it's definitely a lot like the Haunted Mask from the Goosebump series. I would still say this isn't quite as good as the Haunted Mask. Obviously that's like one of my favorite books ever, but it was still a really fun read. It gave me all of those nostalgic childhood feelings of sitting underneath the tree in my front yard as a kid on a nice summer day and reading Goosebump books all afternoon. It really made me smile a lot and it's so short, so quick to read. I read this in one sitting. I will also say that C.S. James reached to some deeper places than R.L. Stein usually did with Goosebumps because our main character is dealing with the loss of her father and she's not really been the same since then. And I thought that was a really good parallel of her changing as a person since the death of her dad and also changing physically into these monsters. So if you have a kid who has read all the Goosebump books already and you wanna get them something else, I would say this series is a really good way to go. And from the perspective of somebody like me who grew up with the Goosebumps books as a kid, this was really fun and very charming. Also, I don't know if this was intentional, but the Twisted Books to Leave You Shook layout reminds me a lot of the Eek series that I read when I was a kid. This was like an easy reader, goosebumps kind of knockoff. I saw this cover and just immediately had this flashback of reading these books in kindergarten. So this triggered a really fun little memory for me. And I should also say that I received all three of these books in exchange for an honest review. That does not affect my review in any way. I'm always going to tell you exactly what I think obviously. The next book is one that I did not receive for review, actually. This is Monster Street, book number one, The Boy Who Cried Werewolf by J. H. Reynolds. Another Goosebumps throwback. So this one is about a kid who, again, is dealing with the loss of his dad. His dad actually died years ago, back when he was a baby, though, so he never knew his dad. And one day, his mom tells him that she is going to send him to stay with his grandparents. His grandparents have something of his dad's that they want to give to him and you don't really know what that is going in. He arrives at his grandparents' farm, and it turns out there is a werewolf that lives in the woods, and his grandparents are telling him to stay out of the woods, do not go there. Pretty early on, I knew exactly where this book was going, and it, it's written for kids, so, you know, it happens. But I still thought this was a really fun and charming read. Again, gave me all of those Goosebumps vibes. This one actually really reminded me of The Werewolf of Fever Swamp, which is book 14 in the Goosebumps series. But I really liked this. I thought it was cute. The ending was actually very sweet and heartfelt, and the book overall is pretty well written. My next four-star read is Fangs by Sarah Anderson. This is actually a really short little comic. I wouldn't even call it a graphic novel. This is uh, more of just like a compilation of comic strips, so it's very short, it only took me like 15 minutes to read. I actually read this on Valentine's Day, and this is about a vampire and a werewolf who are in a relationship, and just their cute little quirks about their romance. It's also a really nice cloth-bound book. It's got the black edges all the way around, so it's very well designed. Not horror, but it's still, you know, spooky. It's genre, it's got vampires and werewolves, and a lot of dark humor. Very, very dark black humor. It spoke my language, so there's Fangs by Sarah Anderson. My next four-star read is one that I've already done a 20-minute video about. My reading vlog was actually all about this book, and that is Graveyard Smash, Women of Horror Anthology, Volume 2 from Kadisha Press. This is a anthology full of wonderful, talented female horror writers, but I'm not gonna talk a whole lot more about this because I've already done a huge video. But yeah, overall, I really do recommend this, and I need to get the first volume, and I do have a copy of the third volume coming to me, so really excited to read those. And lastly, we have my five-star horror read. When I revisit books from my childhood, there's always a little bit of hesitation going in because I always wonder, 
what if this book doesn't hold up? What if I don't like it as much as I did when I was a kid? And I was a bit hesitant to check out this one, but again, it was Women of Horror Month and I, I kind of wanted to squeeze in one more horror author. And one of my favorite female horror authors when I was a kid was Mary Downing Hahn. She wrote some amazing ghost stories and my favorite book of hers was always Wait Till Helen Comes. So I decided to give it a reread. Boy, am I glad I did because I liked this even more than I did when I was a kid. This is about a family of five. You have the mother who just recently went through a divorce and she remarried. She has two kids of her own from her first marriage and then he has a kid of his own from his first marriage. So the two families come together and decide to move out to this old renovated church out in the countryside. Our main character is the daughter of the mother who does not like the idea of moving out into the middle of the countryside. She is also very paranoid. She's a very scared kid and the idea of moving to an old renovated church just kind of creeps her out. Also her new stepsister Heather is a spoiled rotten rat. She is also a liar. She's always saying things that aren't true just to get her step siblings in trouble. Well, it turns out there is a cemetery on the grounds of the church where they're living, which is home to the grave of Helen, which is a young girl who died in the lake on the property. And local legend has it that the ghost of Helen resides in the lake and she will call kids out to drown them. And of course, her next victim is Heather and things just escalate from there. This was such a cozy, fun, well-written book. It is brisk, fast-paced, to the point. This takes place in the summertime, so you've got all of those descriptions of the heat and the smell of freshly cut grass and the fireflies at night. It just made me want summer. But just because this takes place in the summertime doesn't mean that there isn't a ton of spooky atmosphere. There's always this overcast in the sky. And then of course you have the setting of this old renovated church and the cemetery that sits off just in the field. Just lots of spookiness and the book actually has a really good message as well. So five stars. Still one of my favorite books ever. So there you have it. That is my February horror wrap up. Again, if you want to see the other books that I read in February, you can go down below to the graveyard and click my Goodreads link where you can read all of my reviews of the other books that I read. Thank you creeps so much for watching this video. If you've watched this far, please, please, please don't forget to give me a like down below and also leave me a comment letting me know if you've read any of these books and what you thought. And I hope you have a very spooky day. Later creeps.